Good morning. Let's look at the Word of God. I'm reading out of the New American Standard. Timothy 2, the second book of Timothy, the third chapter, 1 through 14. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, so these men also oppose the truth men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus's and Jambres's folly was also. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra and what persecutions I endured and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse deceiving and being deceived You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of knowing from whom you have learned them. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your eternal word, your holy word, your inspired word. We thank you that you use it in our lives. We thank you that Jesus is the word of life. Through him, we have true life and forgiveness of sins. Lord, we think of this passage today. We ask you to help us open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our lives to apply to our own lives what you'd want us to apply. Help us to be ready to do that. Guide us now, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. Now, how would you describe the life of the Apostle Paul? What adjective might you use to do picked his life. What comes to my mind is the word maybe faithful. Paul was faithful. He was a faithful servant of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was really was faithful in good times and in tough times. And it's really no surprise to us when we see how Paul writes in 1 Corinthians the following, be imitators of me just as I am also of Christ. Now, in essence, you don't follow Paul, but the Lord. However, Paul is a good example for us. And what is written here is written for your benefit. It's also written for my benefit. And consider this amazing fact. Here we have a document that was written roughly 2,000 years ago, and yet it clearly points to the challenges of our time and exhorts us to live and serve God in a committed way. We need to remain faithful to God even when seemingly every life circumstance seems to be going against us. We need to remain faithful to the Lord, to continue in the Lord. This is really your calling. This is our calling from the commander. You must remain faithful until the end. You should remain faithful to Christ in the big things. You should remain faithful to Christ in the little things. 
And what the 14th verse states is significant. Again, that 14th verse, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Paul tells Timothy to pursue a course which is the very opposite of the difficult things mentioned at the start of the passage I read. There's a long list of problematic and sad trends in the first century which almost in all ways describes our own times. Timothy is to pursue a course that is the complete opposite of the sad condition among men and in addition he was to go against the false teaching that was taking place in Ephesus. Now, if you look at verses 10 through 14, you'll see three main emphases that Timothy was to follow the Apostle Paul in. Three key elements. The first emphasis was sound teaching. The second was a godly lifestyle. And the third was a right approach to persecutions and sufferings. You can said another way, right doctrine or a right lifestyle or right reaction to life's most challenging and difficult trials and problems. Let's start right in the beginning there with the right teaching. Verse 10 says, now you followed my teaching. Paul had a close relationship with Timothy. He had been a true spiritual son of Paul. Paul had discipled Timothy. Paul reminds him of the fact that he followed Paul's teaching that Timothy should continue believing these right things. Now, if, if you skip down to the 14th verse, you'll notice that following the Bible's teaching is not just a matter of filling your mind with knowledge or information. Just learning is not enough. Hendrickson writes that what has been learned must be applied to the heart by the Holy Spirit so that one also becomes convinced with a conviction that transforms life. He writes, Paul writes, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of. When you consider Timothy's original assignment from the Apostle Paul back in 1 Timothy, you begin to get the whole picture of how weighty and difficult this task was for Timothy. In both of Paul's letters to Timothy, Paul is trying to encourage his son in the faith. You remember what he wrote in 1 Timothy. The first chapter, the third verse. As I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Now, Paul had other obligations. He had other tasks in mind in departing from Macedonia. And so he left Timothy in Ephesus to teach sound doctrine and correct those that were teaching spurious things. Timothy had to do this as a young pastor with several elders who had already gone astray. Several elders had been excommunicated, Hymenius and Alexander. Now, think of that. A young pastor having to face that, having that task, pretty difficult work for a young pastor. And, but Paul's word to Timothy is clear. Timothy, you followed sound doctrine, now continue in it. And Timothy has to swim against the current of falsehood. John Stott writes the following. With the current decline of morality, the pretense of religion, and the spread of false doctrine, Paul challenges Timothy to be faithful, even if Timothy has to persevere on his own. And that really is the way it is. Sometimes you have to stand alone for the truth. You have to resist the, the mentality of the herd. You have to stand in such a way that you turn your face against the strong winds that are blowing at you, directly at you. And God's will in certain situations that we stand alone. Paul writes, now you followed my teaching. Timothy, you were faithful. Continue in it. 
When I think of standing against falsehood and spurious trends in religion, I go back in church history and often think of four Czech theological students back in the 15th century, three years before John Huss was burned at the stake in 1415, so we're in the year 1412, four theological students who were executed for their protest of indulgences practiced by the medieval church. They looked at this and they said, this is not biblical, this is not right. Remember, indulgences in the Roman Catholic Church were a grant of remission of the punishment in purgatory still due for sins of people after their death. So purgatory was kind of this intermediate zone between heaven and hell. To further really examine that, that concept that they taught during that era, the supposed merit that needed to be credited to a soul in purgatory would be drawn from deceased Christians who had lived an exemplary life. And there was this storehouse of merit that could be applied to others in this system of indulgences. And so, so for deceased relatives, you could give some money or alms, which would relegate this sufficient amount of merit so they'd finally make it to heaven. The famous phrase that you've probably heard as you've studied history as well, the, the heretic Tetzel said this during Luther's day, every time a coin in the coffer rings, a soul in purgatory springs. Guilt really was used to motivate ordinary people to give to collectors of money for projects primarily going on in the city of Rome. And as you can see, these Czech theological students were well ahead of their day in protesting this totally unbiblical teaching about how to gain merit before the God of the universe. And so these students said, no, these teachings are wrong. And they were taken to the old town square in Prague and executed, these four theological students. They were convinced, really, of the truth of Scripture and paid the price for it. Their convictions really, really resulted in a really a glorious exit to their heavenly home. Quickly, a glorious exit. They lived according to their convictions. And you, you think about maybe the average Czech on the street of Prague today, and you might ask them, you know, how, how do you make it to heaven? How do you get to heaven? A lot of people would say, hey, you have to do enough good things to get there. You have to have enough deeds. So really a lot really hasn't changed. You think about a poor and inadequate view of what the scriptures say. We know, we know that we're saved only by the finished work of Jesus Christ, that we're grafted into him, connected to him through faith, and the Spirit of God lives in us. His righteousness is placed on us. Our sins are on Christ. That's the only merit that we have before the living God. Now going back to Paul's words, he, says, he said in this text, now you followed my teaching, verse 10. You, however, continue in things you have learned and become convinced of, Verse 14, you could also say that Paul's writings here in 2 Timothy encompass the big picture. Now, what do I have in mind when I say the big picture? Particularly being a missionary, I have in mind the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. 
So continuing the things learned and becoming convinced of them pertains to the Great Commission. It pertains to the final words of Christ. The work of Christ's commission must involve evangelism, but the mandate from the Lord is also to teach followers of Christ to observe all that he commanded the original disciples. This was Timothy's calling, and this is our calling today. And it really is it's pretty easy to get sidetracked off the main thing. The church can get involved in a lot of different things, but may stray really from fulfilling the Great Commission. It would have been easy for the Apostle Paul to kind of take the easy route. He could have done maybe the minimum, spent his time in Sarsis. But we don't see that. We see a man committed to the task. We also see him trying to instill in his followers to follow Christ wholeheartedly, writing these letters. We must never give in and take the easy path, even though it's a great temptation. An example of someone following the truth of, of Scripture with conviction would be the Czech reformer John Huss. I mentioned him here just briefly. Huss, remember, lived 100 years before Martin Luther. Good way to keep your church history in mind. 14th century is Wycliffe. 15th century is John Huss. 16th century is Calvin, Luther, and others. Haas ran into extreme difficulty with the Catholic authorities of his day. He ran into extreme difficulty for preaching and standing for the truth of God, primarily looking at the decadence in the church and speaking and writing against it. He wrote a treatise on the church. He really didn't want to start a new church. He loved the church, but he wanted to reform it. He wanted a pure church. And so he spoke adamantly against the corruption in the church. He preached faithfully from the scriptures in check so the people could understand it right in the heart of Prague. Eventually he was pushed out into the countryside. Did his message change? No. He kept preaching righteousness in the countryside. Eventually he was called in to defend his views. He was promised safe passage got to Constance on the Swiss-German border, was arrested the day he got there. He was thrown in prison, put on trial, found guilty, defrocked, drug out of the city, and burned at the stake just on the outside of Constance. Let's think of Timothy's situation, his life situation here. He was deeply committed to sound doctrine. He faithfully held to the teaching he received from Paul. And, and when you think of missions or our mission work, like in the Czech Republic, you like to think it just involves getting the good news out to people, getting them in the gospel, which we're doing. But the real reality is that every theological error seems to surface when you least affect expect it. Airs about who God is, the way of salvation. And so to continue in the things you have learned by implication means to combat error. That's part of the work. So we must hold firmly to the truth and it keeps us from drifting off and losing focus. So that's sound doctrine. That's right teaching. That second emphasis in the text in verses 10 through 14, is godly living. Paul writes, you followed my conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance. Timothy did not just learn how to preach and teach from Paul. Timothy learned how to live. He learned how to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And you need to live in such a way in such an unselfish way. And you need to, need to strive to honor God in all that you do. So you must differ from how Paul describes people in that 
first section of that section I read, lovers of self, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And this also involves a clear purpose in life. You must be determined and committed to Christian truth and strive for hope and the proclamation of the, the gospel in really some manner daily. Think of what Paul wrote about Timothy in another section of scripture. Do you remember that short paragraph in the second chapter of Philippians? If, if you have your Bibles, you can uh, turn there just briefly. Philippians 2, 20, 2, 20. He writes this. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth that he served me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Think of that description there. It just jumps out at you. Genuinely concerned for their welfare, their spiritual welfare, not seeking his own interests. So you could see why Paul writes here, you followed my conduct, purpose, and faith. Your life must be also characterized by patience and love and perseverance, particularly when times, times are trying. The tougher it gets, these are the things that need to characterize our life. This leads Paul to the third emphasis in the text we're looking at today, persecution and suffering. Look at the cities that Paul lists in his text. On the first missionary journey, these three cities, Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, three cities located in what we know as modern Turkey today, all were settings of tough resistance to Paul's message, tough resistance to the proclamation of the gospel in all those cities. In Antioch, Paul was driven out. In Iconium, the minds of the Gentiles were poisoned against the missionaries by Jews with the threat of physical harm. And really what happened in Lystra is in many ways really shocking, if you think about it. You remember, they were welcomed as Greek gods, but Paul was then stoned. And really what is remarkable about all these efforts in these three cities, these missionary efforts, even though there was tough resistance, congregations were established in each of those cities by God's grace. And really planting a church is basically a lot of hard work. Timothy came from Lystra. And what happened on the first missionary journey is really well known. Paul and Barnabas got to Lystra and a man was healed who had been lame from birth. And the local residents saw this happen. And they declared that these two missionaries were Greek gods. They've come down among us. Barnabas is Zeus. Paul is Hermes. But we know the scenario turned around very quickly. Acts 14. You remember the text. Acts 14, 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around, he got up and entered the city. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. Where does Paul go after being stoned? He goes back into the same city that just stoned him. And there's a good probability that young Timothy was a witness to this event. And it made an indelible impression on him. And Timothy said to himself, this guy Paul takes his Christianity seriously. To what degree do we all take our Christianity seriously. To what degree? I would say this. 
the fact that you have discipleship program in this church, a lot of churches don't do anything like that. Take advantage of it. Spend time with someone that is more seasoned in, in the faith. Someone that's more mature. Gain all you can. You may not be at this church forever. You may move to some other, but while you're here, gain all you can. In addition, in addition to the Czech reformer John Huss, one of his closest colleagues, known as Jerome of Prague, was also put on trial in Constance. Okay, Jerome of Prague. Jerome also adhered to the same belief as Huss. He believed that both elements should be administered, the faithful and communion. So we have both elements today, but in the 15th century, normal congregants couldn't partake of the wine. So that was a radical view in the 15th century. He also believed in preaching the word of God and he taught against church extravagance and decadence. So Jerome, however, under extreme pressure in prison, recanted his own biblical views and the views of Huss. And as a result, Jerome was released. However, the following year, in 1416, Jerome was put on trial again because the authorities didn't believe his recantation was heartfelt. It wasn't a true recantation. And this time around, Jerome of Prague remained faithful to the Lord, stuck to his biblical convictions, and was burned at the stake at the same spot that John Huss was burned at in 1415. Before his death, Jerome said this, all my sins did not bother my conscience so much as the sin when at my appeal I unjustly spoke against that good and holy man, Master John Huss. Jerome revoked for good the retraction which he had made at the church trial in Constance and he said he had done it for fear of death and for the smallness of his soul. The smallness of his spirit, he wrote. He had done it. Jerome really had failed significantly, but repented and then went on to live for the Lord. And there's really a risk in believing the right things, but it leads to a transformed life with godly convictions. A transformed life grounded in the truth, stands for the truth, clings to the truth, does not fear the prospect of even dying for the truth. And how does the Lord want you to stand for truth in Broomfield, Lafayette, Boulder? How does he want you to stand for truth? A commitment to the truth led Jerome of Prague to be faithful to God in all ways. It led to a life characterized by right conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecution, and suffering. May this be characteristic of us as well. Amen. Lord, we do come to you and thank you for this text. We thank you that it was written from prison, from a miserable prison in Rome, with death around the corner for Paul. But even these last words ring full of hope, hope in God, hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. May we be faithful in these matters, Lord. May we think about how to continue in the truth, how to be transformed by that truth, how to grow in our convictions that we stand for the right things in our families, at the workplace, in our communities, and in our church, Lord. What a great privilege to have your word. Help us, Lord, now again to apply it to our lives. In Christ's name we pray.